の友達だ。They say you never forget your first time, and that couldn't be truer of my first Godzilla movie, Jun Fukuda's 1972 film Godzilla vs. Gigan. The film turns 50 in March of this year, and since it was my first Godzilla film, I choose to honor its 50th anniversary with a review. Godzilla vs. Gigan doesn't come close to being one of the best entries in the franchise. Despite my nostalgia, I recognize that it's a bad film, but. It's an enjoyably bad film with some redeeming qualities. Shinichi Sekizawa once again samples the alien invasion plot thread, but it's not as compelling or entertaining this time around. When you look at Sekizawa's past screenplays like Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster or Monster Zero, you can see the fiery passion behind his writing. Unfortunately, Godzilla vs. Gigan shows Sekizawa's fatigue for the genre. Sekizawa manages to retain his signature humor, quirky characters, but what he struggles with is the story. He establishes a mystery that's pretty interesting at first. However, Sekizawa fails at keeping it that way because our interest quickly fades away, and by the time we get to the half-hour mark, the mystery is over. Godzilla vs. Gigan is not one of Sekizawa's best scripts and plays more like a 90-minute extended cut of an Ultraman episode. Sekizawa handles his characters a little bit better than the story. These films typically have either scientists, reporters, or military figures as the leads, but this time, Sekizawa hands the reins over to a manga artist, a hippie, a computer expert, and a woman with poor fashion taste. Hiroshi Ishikawa and Minoru Takashima deliver amusing performances with the lackluster material they're given. What makes them stand out is the small quirks they add to their performances, like Ishikawa raising his hands or the weird high-pitched voice he does in this scene. Moshi moshi. And Takashima ensures his legacy with this iconic moment in cinema history. He must have thought it was a gun. Tomoko Umeda is the one who sets things in motion, but she's forced to share the spotlight with the rest of the ensemble. Unfortunately, her only value is sharing details that advance the plot. But once this is fulfilled, she's cast aside for the remainder of the film. Her brother is criminally wasted. He was close to the aliens and somehow never found out how to stop them. I was disappointed that Yuriko Hishimi didn't do a lot of combat material in Ultra 7, and I think both Sekizawa and Jun Fukuda felt the same way because Yuriko does way more ass kicking in this film than she did on Ultra 7. Unfortunately, her character doesn't add much to the film, but her character is the one that stands out the most thanks to her charming performance, how she gives attitude to Gengo, her karate skills. An ugly fashion sense that even Gengo mocks, and just like Takashima, Yuriko ensures her legacy with this classic line. You cheeky pig! The origin and intentions behind the aliens is interesting, but they're wasted as characters. Instead of being sympathetic creatures in need of a new home, they come off more as dull Bond villains. The kaiju are dull, but since the movie itself is equally as dull. You don't expect much characterization from the kaiju, and they deliver the monster melee destruction you come to expect. King Ghidorah is only in the film to save Toho money by recycling footage from Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster and Monster Zero. While Gigan has one of the most unique, badass designs for a Showa Godzilla kaiju, there's not much of a character to him. However, he does have some amusing moments, and Kenpachiro Satsuma. Does a decent job at articulating Gigan's emotions through body language. A majority of the music, or all the music in this case, is recycled from Akira Fukube's past soundtracks, but it works. It keeps the film tonally consistent with other Toho Godzilla films and adds to the signature sound that many associate Godzilla with. At times, the film comes off as boring and could have benefited from cutting at least five to ten minutes to tighten the pacing. Especially since the film is relentless in how it excessively uses footage recycled from other movies, it really goes overboard with the stock footage, and as a result, the film drags rather quickly. Taroyoshi Nakano does not deliver his best effects work, but it's really not his fault. By the 70s, Toho began cutting the budget for their Godzilla films, but Nakano makes no effort to hide the movie's budget limitations. 
the Godzilla suit decays on screen, the barren landscape looks used and unoriginal, again the film uses stock footage, and the monster fights are slow and sluggish. Overall, Godzilla vs. Gigan is a mediocre cash cow at best. It's well known amongst fans that Jun Fukuda did not like his sci-fi movies, and his unenthusiasm and lack of innovation ensures the film's status as a forgettable Godzilla film. But personally, I can't forget it because it was the first film to pop my Godzilla cherry. While I do admit that Godzilla vs. Gigan is a bad, poorly made film, I'd argue that it's a semi-perfect film to initiate children into Godzilla. It uses Ifukube's best music, the best stock footage, and features a four-way monster fight. At least, those are the qualities why I loved the movie when I was a kid. While Godzilla vs. Gigan may not be the perfect Godzilla film, it was my first, and I wish it a glorious 50th anniversary. I award Godzilla vs. Gigan 2 stars out of 4.